Good afternoon, and welcome back to another rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space. Kirsty McConnell, co-founder of the Pet Photographers Club, is joining me today. And Kirsty, I'm a little nervous. I haven't presented in a while, so if I if I hide or if I duck off camera, you might just have to uh, carry it for me today. But welcome. It's great to have you on. Hi, Derek. Thanks for having me. That's all right. I'm sure I can handle that, bud. You feel. I'm feeling the confidence, so we're all good here. There you go. So kirsty has got it covered. So for those of you who don't know why you're here, we're going to discuss a very entry-level discussion on gear for pet photographers. So um, as you're probably going to hear a lot in this presentation, there's a lot of great gear out there. Every brand makes great cameras. Every brand makes some pretty decent lenses at bare minimum, um, especially as compared to years or even decades ago. Uh, but it's really about what is right for you. And you today means those pet photographers out there. So for those of you who have been in the industry, uh, you, hopefully you can pick up some new tips. And for those of you who are watching who are maybe looking to break in or you're more of a beginner or entry-level user, hopefully we can provide you a lot of information. And Kirsty is here to help me with that. So we're going to go over a brief overview of gear, meaning camera bodies, camera lenses, and we're going to get Kirsty's insight on which is best for which situations and for pet photographers specifically, what is the gear and the features that matter more than maybe some other stuff there. So I will remind everybody first, welcome to everybody joining us from all the simulcasts across the interwebs across the world. If you do have any questions, definitely get them in. This is going to be an informative session. We really want to get to the information that you all want to know. So if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to get those in. Um, but Kirsty, let's really, really quick, if you can give us just a brief introduction about you, your photography path and the, pep, the how you came about with the Pet Photographers Club. So I'm Australian. You might be able to hear from my accent. I started out as a pet photographer more than a decade ago, making me feel old. Um, back then, pet photography was not really a thing in most parts of the world. There was a few um, getting into it in the US, uh, one or two full-time already in Australia um, and so yeah it was just about like breaking the ground with those guys um, I did do that for quite a while in Australia and then in 2018 um, I launched the Pet Photographers Club with uh, my good friend Caitlin from Ragamuffin and Pet Photography in Melbourne so another fellow Aussie um, we realized that there was not really any well there wasn't a podcast specifically for pet photographers. And so we launched that in 2018 when our niche was what we thought was huge compared to when we started. And now it's like ginormous, which is super exciting. Um, so yeah, 2018, that started as like a little side thing. Um, a couple of years ago, I moved to Italy. So now I spend actually most of my time working on the Pet Photographers Club and helping pet photographers around the world um, through that platform. I do shoot a little bit every now and again when I head back to Australia. Um, which I was finally able to do again this year um, after lockdowns, etc. cetera. Uh, but yeah, my primary uh, time is spent or most of my time, oh, see the sun just come straight through there. Uh, my time is mostly spent helping other pet photographers. So that's a bit of my story and how I ended up here today, I suppose. Awesome. Well, we're again, we're excited to have you and we are leaning on your expertise today. Yes, if you want to adjust that, Go for it, Kirsty. We don't want you blinded for the next hour. Um, but just to give you guys all an overview, we're going to drop a link in for those who want a really, really, really beautiful cheat sheet that Kirsty has prepared for us. Uh, so I'm going to have Danny drop the link to that in the comments section. We'll get it dropped. If you're joining us here on Zoom, we'll get it dropped in the, the chat there for you. And it's really just going to outline this brief discussion that we're going to go over today. So again, we're not getting too far into the weeds today. We're going to keep it very, very, very basic, very entry level. There's going to be some some details and specs that we're going to miss. Can't go into everything in an hour. Um, really, the idea is to get you started and give you some kind of direction. So um, that being said, the first discussion we're going to talk about is our bodies. So there's four main camera types. We're not going to discuss all four. Uh, we are really going to lean on the two most prominent for, for pet photography, which are DSLR and mirrorless. Of course, you also have your point and shoot cameras and your bridge cameras. So point and shoot, pretty much just like it says, it's a smaller camera, smaller sensor size, more compact, made to carry around. Of course, you're not going to get the professional quality results that you would in a mirrorless or DSLR camera, thus making it not probably the best option for pet photography. 
Same thing goes for bridge cameras. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with what a bridge camera is, it is the bridge between a compact camera, like a point and shoot, and a professional camera or a larger system like a DSLR or mirrorless. Uh, a common feature of the bridge cameras, it's a fixed lens, just like a point and shoot is. And it has, they're also called super zooms by some people. A lot of times you'll have a range that goes from wide angle to telephoto or super telephoto. Um, again, smaller sensor size, smaller feature set. So you're not getting the image quality. Now, for those of you out there who don't have the budget to start with even a DSLR or a mirrorless, great options. Whatever camera you have at your disposal is always the best option. There's plenty of people who are out there shooting billboards, coffee table books, and gallery exhibitions with cell phones. So don't let anything limit you. Really, today is about discussing what is best for pet photographers. So uh, just to give you guys a little bit of an intro on DSLRs, DSLRs for a long time, and in the introduction to the digital age, uh, was really the camera that most professional photographers were using, at least those that switched over to digital from, from film. And when you're looking at DSLRs, it's a bigger setup, uh, high quality images, generally less expensive for equivalent quality of a mirrorless. And that's one of the pros that stands out with the DSLR. If you go with an entry level DSLR, DSLR system, such as the Sony a6000 series or the Canon Rebel series, you can generally get a more affordable DSLR camera than you can mirrorless for entry level. Not always true. Again, everything we say today, there's going to be a lot of caveats. There's a lot of stuff that is updating as the technology updates. And uh, really, you're going to, it, it all depends where you look on the internet. Sometimes you're going to get a, a mirrorless, you get a better deal on a mirrorless than a DSLR. But generally, now that the technology is switching over to mirrorless, you're going to find that uh, some of your, your used and older DSLR setups are going to be a little less expensive than the mirrorless. You're still getting great image quality. And that was always the thing. Kirsty, I don't know when you switched over to mirrorless. I was a holdout for a long time because I wasn't sold on the quality of mirrorless systems. Um, so DSLRs have been known for their outstanding image quality. And with the DSLR systems, you have everything from micro four thirds to APS-C, which is commonly called a crop sensor to your full frame. Um, and fast autofocus was another feature that was always paramount in DSLRs. Now, a lot of things we're gonna be talking about today as we transition to the mirrorless discussion is why Kirsty and I are kind of on the same page on this, that mirrorless is the future. So when we start talking more heavily leaning towards mirrorless, it might be because we're both mirrorless shooters and, and we've transitioned. Um, but one thing to, to point out is that DSLR cameras were great for a reason, which means they're still great for a reason. And as the technology advances, I do want to point that out that just because technology has gotten better doesn't mean that anything from the past is inferior. So if you had a DSLR camera, most of my early uh, portfolio was shot on Canon 5D Mark II, 5D Classic, 6D. Um, those images aren't any less great in my mind today because they were shot on a DSLR. Um, but going into some of the cons of the DSLR system, it's generally a little larger, a little bulkier. Um, again, as we get into the discussion on some of the mirrorless, you're going to see that's not always true. Sometimes it's not about the overall size. It's about the weight distribution. And for some people, I have big hands. I always liked having a DSLR because it felt more solid in my hands. Some of the smaller setups, I feel like, uh, like you know, I'm holding one of those old flip phones and not an actual camera. Um, so bulkier, good for some, not good for others. Um, but I think that was what drew a lot of people to the mirrorless systems is when mirrorless came out, it was, you were slimming down your system. You can go out and get professional results and you didn't have to carry around that quote unquote professional size. Um, and really the biggest con in my opinion about DSLRs is that mirrorless has caught up. A lot of the things that made DSLRs great when mirrorless first came on the scene was that mirrorless didn't have them. You didn't have the image quality. The autofocus wasn't there yet. And as we move this discussion over to mirrorless now, you have a lot of the features. So again, we can't go into every feature. It goes across brands. It goes across types. You have everything from micro four thirds to APS-C, full frame, even uh, medium format mirrorless systems that are 
just as fast as some of the DSLR systems that are out there. So technology has gotten to be very impressive. Uh, again, pros with the mirrorless system, you're looking at generally a lighter, smaller setup. I say generally because there's always a caveat. And you do have some mirrorless systems that are a little larger in the body. They do weigh a little more. Um, it's not that super, super, super light setup that you used to think of when you thought of mirrorless. And also the lenses. You do have lenses that are comparable in size and weight to DSLR lenses. So where that plays in, and a lot of people don't think about this, Kirsty, I don't know if it matters to you, but weight distribution, not necessarily weight, but weight distribution. It, does weight distribution play like how comfortable the lens feels on the body? Definitely. Actually, you mentioned earlier, you don't know how long I held out for. Um, I shop all my professional work um, until 2020 on a D800, which was made in you probably know 2012 maybe or <laughs> I don't know it was like 10 years old um and you know I never upgraded it because why uh, my clients were happy with the work it printed as big as I needed it was fine it, it matched all my criteria so when you shot on a body for that long and and that same lens kit for so long I mean I knew how to like in my hands it was like Part of my own body you know I knew exactly how it felt and definitely the weight distribution of um, that body with the 85 mil which is what I shot on a lot of the time we'll get into that in lenses um, I'm, I'm sure um, felt so good in my hands then um, I switched to um, mirrorless because I wasn't shooting professionally for pets for a short period um, when I first moved and uh, I do a lot of travel photography as I travel and so I already had a early mirrorless travel camera. Um, and so I just, that became my primary camera. And I'll tell you, it was a big adjustment uh, switching from something that was like a second hand, you know, like a thick extension of my body to this little tiny thing that was super light, which is why I loved it. Because, you know, you didn't need to pay for extra carry-on luggage, for example, when you're traveling. Uh, but uh, yeah, it did take a lot to adjust to like how it felt in my hands. Um, now that was only four thirds. And so when I started shooting pets again, um, that wasn't really up to the job as much as I was. I mean, if you're just starting out, you could totally go with that. Um, but I was used to a certain quality and I couldn't, you know, couldn't really go back. And so I upgraded my gear. Um, now I've got a Sony and a couple of other prime lenses. And I tell you, it's again, another adjustment, like where is the switches, you know, et cetera. But um, again, another big one with that is definitely how it feels in your hands. I was surprised you mentioned the weight before. Um, I was really surprised. I bought the Sony 135 mil and I couldn't believe the weight. Uh, because I was expecting it to be light. Uh, it's made especially for mirrorless. And uh, oh, sorry, the Sigma. Did I say Sony before? It doesn't matter. And uh, yeah, I was really surprised by the weight. I was like, gee, what is this? My 7200 again? Like it was, it's quite heavy. So yeah, definitely it's an adjustment. Um, and that's like very weight uh, forward heavy, I guess you would say, right? Because the lens is quite heavy. That lens in particular is quite heavy in comparison to the camera body. So Probably, I mean, I know a lot of photographers that switch to mirrorless for the weight, um, if they've got bad wrists or a bad shoulder or something in particular for pet photographers, where we're always on the ground propped up on our elbows and in weird positions with our hands. Um, yeah, that's definitely something to keep a, keep your mind on when you're doing the switch that, you know, it might be lighter all over, but maybe like it's going to be a bit more heavy at the front or, or whatever it might be. So yeah, I think that's a very valid point that you raised, Eric, for sure. Yeah, I mean, well, that's initially what drew me to mirrorless was a smaller setup and carrying mm -hmm. something around lighter. So I think it might catch some people off guard who go to a mirrorless setup and then you get something like a Sony Alpha 1 with a 70 to 200 on it and exactly the same reaction that you had. People are like, wait, I thought this was supposed to be like a paperweight and it's not. So that's mm -hmm. that's definitely something that matters. Now, I do want to go into another feature that I think is one of if not, in my opinion, the greatest feature of the mirrorless over the DSLR. And that's the electronic viewfinder. I never thought I would get used to it. I love the optical viewfinder. 
And really the optical viewfinder on a DSLR is what made it better in low light. And the EVF, again, early iterations of mirrorless cameras that I got my hands on, I didn't feel the EVF was there. It takes getting used to. But since I've gotten used to the EVF, one of the things I really love about it, I love not guessing. I love knowing exactly how my preview is going to look. Again, I said I was going to say this a lot during this next hour. It comes with caveats, depending on how you have your settings. You have certain uh, electric viewfinders, electronic viewfinders that aren't as fast. You Some cameras deal with blackout issues where when you're taking images, you lose your view through the electronic viewfinder um, that aren't as quick. Um, obviously, with an optical viewfinder, what you see is what you get. And I've even found, depending on how you set your camera up, sometimes what you think you're shooting and what you see through the electronic viewfinder is not what you're getting because you can change your settings around to show what you're really seeing or to show if you've made in-camera edits, what those are. Sometimes, depending on how you meter, you might have um, face detection on and your metering is locked in in stride with the face detection. So you might think you're taking an exposed image, but it's face detection picks up and it exposes for the face. And now you have a blown out image or an image that's underexposed because the face is different than what your general settings are. I know that's a lot of word salad there, um, but basically to say that in EVF, they still are, it's not a 100% accurate thing. You do have nuances with them. But overall, I love the ability to shoot in black and white. I love adjusting my color profile and being able to see my results beforehand. Now I want to know what you think. And in regards to pet photographers, since that's what we're here for, uh, is the move to an EVF a beneficial thing? Oh, all right. It's a bit of a loaded question, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no wrong Sorry. answers. Remember that, um, just for everybody, I'm pretty old school. I mean, I learned on film, uh, despite being young, um, I learned on film. Uh, then I shot on this uh, D, D90, D70, D800 for like a decade. Um, and so I'm not really good with change, clearly. <laughs> I was used to, like, actually, I might just back up a little second, actually, just for those that are listening that maybe you've only shot on mirrorless or you've only shot a DSLR, I might just elaborate a little bit on what we're talking about. Because I remember the first time I shot a mirrorless, I was like, what is going on right now? I had, I mean, despite being a professional photographer, I I mentioned to Derek before this uh, webinar began, I'm not really into gear that much, as in changing gear and shooting on the same thing for a long time. So I wasn't like doing much research or this kind of thing at the time. And uh, I was just shooting on my day 800 and I picked up this mirrorless and I was like, what is going on? So basically when you look through the viewfinder, just for anybody that's not clear on what we're talking about, um, it uh, creates a digital image of what the final image is gonna look like as long as you're setting the set appropriately as Derek covered before. Whereas your DSLR, you're looking through exactly like the lens. And so um, uh, it doesn't take into account that you might change your settings to be under or overexposed, for example. So in, if you haven't already, interesting to go and have a play with that. Like if you can get your hands on both, like a mirrorless and a DSLR and just compare, it's like pretty trippy when you first do that. So that was just a quick uh, back step. But in terms of how is it for pet photographers, I tell you what, I wish I could learn on mirrorless. I mean, it makes it much easier where you can see what your mistakes are. You can learn in real time. I mean, you look through, um, like, I mean, teaching my husband how a camera works now on a mirrorless is the easiest thing ever. Because it's like, look, this is the shutter speed. Turn it down. Oh, look, the image is dark. Turn it up. Oh, look, the image is too bright. In real time, it's very cool. Rather than taking it, looking at the view, uh, the back of the camera on a DSLR, for example. So to learn on a mirrorless, I think it's very cool because you can learn a lot, I believe, uh, a lot quicker. I guess it means that you don't really have to learn the technical, but... What do we really, as much, you know, as in detail, what do we really need it for? At the end of the day, the idea is to create beautiful images. This is my opinion, at least. Um, so if it can speed up your learning process, I'm all for that, right? Because we all want to be amazing photographers and creating beautiful art for our clients. So I'm all for that. Um, knowing that you made a mistake before you make the mistake, like before you press the uh, shutter, fantastic. I mean, the worst thing would be to underexpose an entire a shoot for example and not realize or a whole series in a shoot and not realize um 
So yeah, I definitely think that there are heaps of pros for that, especially for when you're starting out. Um, yeah, I can't really fault it, to be honest. I mean, yeah, you did mention that there can be a lag for some models. Um, I haven't seen that in my model, um, in my current camera, so I can't really compare. Um, but if that's the case, I can imagine that would be quite frustrating. So maybe that's actually probably a good tip that if you are comparing between a body that is known to have a bit of a lag or to black out or something like that, if that's where your budget finishes, I would maybe even consider like, okay, what's the alternate? Is there a model equivalent that doesn't have that? Because that would be very frustrating. Or are you better off in going DSLR, in fact? Um, because like you said at the very beginning, Derek, I mean, it was good enough then, so it's still good enough now, you know? Um, so yeah, and you can pick them up, as you mentioned, pretty cheap now as well. So if it's about budget, then that could be a nice solution. Um, but yeah, definitely with my model, I haven't experienced that. So can't really speak for it firsthand. Oh, that's great. Well, the other thing I want to move to is, and I know this is big for pet photographers, we talked about it a little bit before we went live in the green room is how pets are like people. They're just more unpredictable. They don't talk. Some people argue that. And they move around a lot more. Generally, sometimes, maybe. But accounting for that, obviously, autofocus. Now, if you could do a simple search on the internet, DSLR versus mirrorless, you're going to see DSLRs get the high scores for autofocus. And again, mirrorless has caught up. And in some ways, I would argue that it has surpassed some of the cameras out there. Insane with their autofocusing capabilities. You have cameras that now not only autofocus on the eyes of people, but they autofocus on the eyes of animals and not just dogs and cats, birds. I mean, I've seen some incredible, incredible technology out there. There's technology in some of these cameras that will pick up the human head. And when you turn so that your face isn't there, when it turns, it turns to head detection. And when you turn back and your face is to the camera, it turns back to face detection. Just some really impressive stuff out there. So I'm going to kick it back to you. I would imagine for pet photographers, autofocus is one of the more important features. I would say the most important feature. Um, my grandfather was a photographer. And uh, when I told him that I was going to be a professional pet photographer, he um, elaborated with this uh, huge long story about the one day he had to photograph an Afghan hound for the front cover of a magazine. And he had to take like four rolls of film to get one sharp, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember at the time being like, what? How bad of a photographer were you? But it wasn't until like a few months later or whatever that I, you know, the penny kind of dropped and I put two and two together that he was shooting in the 70s. He had to manually focus on that Afghan hound. And if you've ever photographed an Afghan hound, they don't move that quickly, but they do have like, um, well, in, when you're shooting a portrait anyway, uh, but they do have like often hair over the eyes as well, which can make it really hard to actually focus on the eye if you're shooting, you know, 1.4, 1.8, for example. Of course, this is something I'd never had to do because when I started shooting pets, I was shooting digital on a DSLR with super quick autofocus, you see. So when my grandfather's telling me this story, like, are you crazy? Do you know how hard it is to photograph pets? I was like, what? I hadn't experienced it. So the question comes back to, I mean, your question was, uh, how important is autofocus? It's that important. I mean, four rolls of film for him in the 70s versus me, like I used to shoot and I'm old school, as I mentioned, but I used to shoot an entire session in a hundred uh, shots. So that would be 35 images to show the client out of a hundred that I took. So I was pretty like, I forgot that I wasn't having to reload film. <laughs> uh, nowadays I'm way more free, um, but definitely, you know, my goal was always to get it right when I released the shutter. Um, I had to untrain that way of thinking a little bit. So, you know, being able to focus with a DSLR, uh, definitely like way, um, you know, obviously way easier than way back in the day. Um, and the first time I tried to work with mirrorless, which was not my body that I'm on now, but it was more of a tribal camera. When I tried to photograph my pets, it was like, forget about it. Like you said, the early models were just horrendous with autofocus. I couldn't do it. Um, so I gave up. And now that I've got the Sony, um, I admit it's a learning curve. 
Um, I'm not 100% comfortable with it. But again, I was so comfortable with my old, my DSLR, right? So it's just a learning curve. I do know lots of photographers um, and some big names in the pet photography in industry who, um, who coach for, for craft, like for how to shoot, who swear by the new uh, features of uh, the Canon and the Sony, um, probably all of the brands these days as well. Um, now that they've really learned how to nail that um, animal eye focus, as you mentioned, and I know like, you know, people that are learning from them are just not having any trouble at all. You know, they're just steaming right ahead um, with their focus. And it, for them, I think they're arguing that it's even sharper than, or even, you know, more shots in focus than when they were on their DSLR. I haven't experienced that yet. So maybe I'm still like adapting. Um, but yeah, I do know lots of photographers are very happy with the new animal eye focus. And these are photographers I'm talking about that are comparing to, you know, previously shooting on a 1DX or a 5D Mark III or something like that. So um, so that's like your high level uh, DSLRs. Mm -hmm. You know, it was actually the most interesting thing when you sent the pictures to me of the images that we're going to be taking a look at later. I was more interested in seeing whether they shot mirrorless or DSLR than I was in seeing, which because the focal length is right there. You can tell when you, instantly when you look at the image, you kind of know, obviously on a wide angle shot, you're going to know it's a wide angle. But, um, you know, even when you get into some of the shallower depth of field shots, you know about where it is. You can kind of have a gauge of what kind of lens was used, but you really couldn't tell a difference between DSLR and mirrorless. And I think that's kind of the point that we're talking about here is, again, we don't have time to dive into all of the specs and all the things that make them great or make them great for this or some of their downfalls. Um, but I think the point is, is, as we wrap this discussion of the bodies up, is DSLR mirrorless, it's going to be six of one and half a dozen the other. I think for each person, it's going to be a matter of what really matters to them, right? Both are going to get great results, as you're going to see at the end. And it's really a matter of getting your hands on both systems. And maybe one system might be better for you. And maybe it's going to be a toss up. Maybe you love DSLR and you're still a holdout and you'll get the mirrorless. There'll be that one mirrorless camera that you're going to come across that you're going to be like, you know what? This is the one. Um, Luke you know, has, Derek, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, before we um, move on to lenses, I just wanted to say that I would actually think, because you mentioned about like you couldn't see in the finished images, which was mirrorless and which was DSLR, right? I think as a professional, the thing that's really important to me is how many usable shots are you getting from the shots you take percentage wise, because anybody can photograph like one amazing, and I should just interrupt myself for a second and explain, pet photographers always uh, aiming for getting the best action shot, okay? Of a running super fast, a greyhound or, or a Dalmatian or whatever. Um, and that's a shot that's hard, but if you shoot that a hundred times with a dog running past you, no matter what camera you're on, eventually one is going to be unfocused, no matter what lens and whatever, what uh, camera body. For me as a professional, though, I don't want to be asking my client to get their dog to run a hundred times so that I can finally get it in focus. I want to be able to get it in focus within one, maybe a redo, maybe two shots. If it takes me more than two shots, either I'm not doing my job properly or the camera's not appropriate for what I want to do. So I would just... Um, encourage you all um, if you're considering between you know these different options to consider that is action something that you really want to take how many are you taking and how many times are you willing to get your client's dog to run past you so that you can get that action shot and that might answer the question whether or not you know uh, the focus is even that important after all um, or if um, yeah you know what what really comes comes to play for you Mm -hmm. Now, we had a question come in before we jump over to the lens side of things. I want to bring this question up now. You were a Nikon DSLR shooter. Did you ever shoot in live mode? We have a question from Luke joining us on Vimeo asking, would shooting in live mode on a Nikon D780 be good for autofocus or would purchasing a Z6 II be easier? Now, do you have any experience? Did you shoot in live oh, mode at Luke, all? I'm Luke, I'm sorry. Um, I actually can't answer that from my own personal experience because it's not something I ever did. Um, I only remember ever shooting in live mode when I started playing around with a uh, video. <laughs> so um, I can't really answer that, but I would love to know from your tech uh, knowledge, Derek, uh, what, what it is that you recommend. Honestly, this, this comes down to the, the Z. You have to, you have to break it up because Luke asked if it would be easier. 
easier. Look, look, if money's not an option, of course, every day of the week, I'm going to say if it's, it's easier to just go buy a Z6 too and move on. The technology is great. The autofocus is amazing. Um, and I don't think live mode autofocusing in a D780 is going to gonna even compare. But it's really, again, the theme here is about what's comfortable for you, what's best for you. Is the Z6 II in your budget? And not only is it in your budget now, but it is, is it in your budget going forward? Is it something, a system that you want to build into? Um, again, going from DSLR to mirrorless, you're investing in a new system. And while some of the lenses may transfer over with uh, adapters, you're going to lose some functionality or you might use some fun lose some functionality depending on what system or what lens you're going and converting and what system you're converting it over to. One of the things um, with DSLRs is because they've been around for so many years, there's much more of a robust lens assortment available than DSLR or than, than mirrorless. Mirrorless, the mirrorless selection is catching up. You're seeing a lot of really great mirrorless glass come onto the scene. So Luke, I'm going to sum it up like this. If you are in an area where you can get your hands on the Z6 II, um, go in, try it out, get your hands on it, test it out, or even rent one. A lot of people don't talk enough about renting gear. I am a huge fan of either renting a body, renting a lens before you buy it. It's worth it to pay $60, $80, $100 to have it for three, four days and really get to know if you like that system, you can really use it out. Even when you when you go to a, a wonderful store like B&H and get your hands on the product, you don't get a chance to really test it out in your element. So Luke, I would say rent a Z6 II, see if you like it. My opinion is going to say the Z6 II is, is better. I think mirrorless is the future as we've been talking about, and the autofocus is only going to get better. One of the great things about mirrorless too, you have firmware updates. So you can improve the autofocus of a system just by plugging it into your computer, or downloading it from the app on your phone. So that's going to be my opinion. Not going to say it is necessarily the best answer, the answer that's right for you, but get your hands on it and uh, see for yourself. Um, and we, we welcome your questions in again. We're going to try to give you the best, but definitely the most honest answer. We're not out here to point you in any wrong directions or make a sales pitch on anything. You know, we've tried to make this as brand agnostic as possible and really just talk about the things that matter. And that's that's not the the name on the the camera, the lens. So that being said, we're going to move into lens types. And we have some amazing images to look at once we finish this discussion or as we round it out. So don't get go anywhere. You're going to see some amazing pet photography. I want you to think about what you think of when you think pet photography before we see the images. Because I know I always have this image in mind and the images they're going to blow you away. So let's move into lens types. Uh, so basically lens types, you're looking at fisheye, wide angle, standard, short telephoto, which it will include, I'll include the portrait and macro lenses in that group there, medium telephoto, and then you have your long or super telephoto. So we're going to start it out with uh, fisheye, which is generally about eight millimeters to 35 millimeters. Uh, so you have your fisheye wide angle. Uh, in that range. So from eight to 35 fisheye wide angle, generally, again, generally not going to be used for uh, pet photography or portraits, but it does. And, and I say that when I say that generally, it's more on the fisheye end. Um, Christy's probably going to laugh every time I open my mouth. Christy's like, don't put your foot in your mouth. I'm going to prove you wrong. Um, no, 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 not at all. I'm really <laughs> interested to hear like your perspective, understanding the tech really well. And um, I know the industry very well. This is, <laughs> I, this thinking, is, I love this. <laughs> I'm just thinking as you, um, as you were saying that about uh, fisheye, uh, this year we've, or just uh, two weeks ago, we had our um, International Pet Photographer of the Year Awards release that we host as the club. We released our top 100 shortlist for each category. And I was just picturing uh, this one image that stood in my mind because we never see this uh, was an image taken with a fisheye and it actually made it through one of the open categories. Um, I'm pretty sure. So or the open category, I should say. Um, so yeah, you're right. We generally do not use a fisheye in pet photography, but if you wanted to do something a bit more like artistic or fun, um, that might be an option. It's just, you'd have to be 
I don't know, maybe your clients might be interested in that and it can be your point of difference um, if you're into that kind of look. It's not uh, common to see, but it's totally a valid option. Once you get more towards the 35, you'll see a lot more of that. I know um, if I can name drop probably, um, if you want to check out the work of uh, Kat Race, uh, she's from Cat's Dog Photography in the UK. She does quite a lot of uh, wide stuff, not so much fisheye, um, but somewhere between I'd say 16 and 35 would be like kind of normal range for her. Um, and off camera flash on location. So her work is very uh, unique compared to what you'll see later on when we look at the award-winning images from last year. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in seeing some examples of some wide angle, I definitely recommend you check out Kat's work. She was a judge for us um, in previous years. Um, she's right up there as a leader in the industry. So, and doing something completely unique. So check out her stuff. Uh, but typically you'll see pet photographers, you're right, starting with a 35 um, and then kind of that's the widest that we do traditionally go but like I said there are some exceptions that are doing really beautiful work with some stuff wider too and and you put that beautifully so I'm not even going to try to I'm going to leave that path that you carved and I'm not I'm going to step over here out of the way um and the reason for those of you who are wondering why you we might have some people out there just starting who are wondering why well distortion is probably going to be what most people will say is the reason why they don't use it it's not it, the most flattering and the same goes for dogs and, and really any animal um there's there's a sweet spot that you'll find in portraiture and it's a really cool thing to look up if and if you just google same face at different focal lengths you're going to see probably a million people have done it but it shows the same field of view on a person's face on everything from fisheye lens to super telephoto lens and you see how the face changes depending on what lens it was taken with a portrait was taken with, which is really interesting to see how most people don't look as flattering at, you know, at the wider end. And then as you get into the portrait range of, you know, 85 to 135, it looks very flattering. And then it's the funniest thing happens is the more compressed you go and the more telephoto you go, you start to see the curves start to bend back around where you have another kind of distortion from, you know, the face being too flattened. So it's an interesting thing to see if you guys haven't looked at that, definitely, definitely look that up. Um, so yeah, we're moving to standard. So standard, generally 35 to 85. This is your more normal. When I say normal, um, there's arguments out there that say the human eye sees at about a 50 millimeter. And when we, when we use these, uh, these focal ranges, we're talking in full frame terms and full frame would be equivalent to a 35 millimeter sensor size. So obviously, APS-C, which is going to be smaller than a full-frame sensor, you would have a crop factor. So you would have to multiply the focal length by anywhere from 1.5 to 1.6 on your Canon, Sony, Nikon, Fujifilms to, if you're using micro four-thirds, it would be a two times crop factor. If you need more information on that, again, Google crop factor uh, calculations, or you can shoot us a message here and we could try to go into more detail on that, but standard range, right? Nor more of a normal view, right? Because you're not getting, you're not getting the distortion, really. You, but you're also not getting that compression. So, what what do you find on the standard length? More people are using that for. Is that more for environmental, just like you would with the human portrait? Yeah, exactly. So, if I just flick back to wide angle for a second, um, when you're wide, so I would say somewhere between 16 and 24, for example, you really, and again, this is from uh, my experience and, and seeing this in lots of images, I would suggest that most photographers shooting at those kind of focal lens have no, have no choice but to center the dog. Because as soon as you put the subject over to the side, then you're getting this all sorts of weird distortion going on because of the curvature of the lens. Um, and again, like Derek mentioned, if you do look up these different comparisons, you'll see what I'm talking about, um, or even trial it yourself. I do recommend it if, you know, you've got some, pull some friends together and trial some different lenses and stuff if you can, but yeah, looking it up uh, will also answer your question. So you're a little bit limited if you're using these wide angles that pretty much you are going to always have to have dog, you know, in the middle of the image. Uh, most likely it's going to look like a big head, small body if you're shooting close enough to the dog. 
uh, with these wide lenses. Once you go into a standard lens, so somewhere between your 35 and 85, you have a lot more options where you can frame differently to that, especially getting closer towards the 85 end than the 35. Um, and again, we'll see this in the examples when we go through them at the end. So what do we use a standard lens for? I would say that typically, well, for me, I used to use it for everything, a prime 85. That's weird, by the way, in the pet world. It's just becoming a bit more common. Um, but I started using primes when I was second shooting weddings and I just loved how light they were. And so I switched even for my pets. Um, so I used my 85 for almost everything. Um, I would do uh, headshots of the dogs, um, vertical ones with the 85. And it's like you said, no distortion. So the dog actually you know, shows its true shape. Um, then you can move backwards and walk backwards um, and get the full body. And again, no distortion, but you get like, a, you know, if you're shooting on say 1.8, 2.8, F4, something like that, you're going to get the background dropping out of focus enough that you're not distracted, which is normally what we're going for with pet portraits, portraits that clients want to buy. A lot of the time we want that focus to be on the dog in this particular image that we're imagining right now um, so definitely the 80 say something around 85 50 to 85 is really nice for that you can you know get a little bit of bokeh in the background um, and your focus is still going to be you're really not focusing camera terms but everybody's you know eye is getting driven straight to the dog without any distortion so that's really nice it gives you lots of options when you're 85 you're also long enough to just start doing a bit of action as well um, because you need to be a bit of a distance from a fast running dog, a horse, a cat, or they're 85 for a horse, probably, probably not, but cat maybe, or a dog, definitely, you could just start doing some action. You might be wishing you had a little bit more length, um, but you could definitely work with that. So it's your most versatile is what I'm trying to say. If you're only, you know, got the budget to buy one lens, most people start with a 50, up, probably because it's nifty 50, nice and cheap. Um, if you can if you've got the budget, I would probably recommend an 85 personally, um, because then you can start doing a little bit of action with that as well. Your 50 you will struggle with or have to crop in quite a lot. And if you're doing that, you're going to need bigger file sizes that we didn't uh, mention, I don't think, uh, much mm -hmm. in the cameras, but that's something to consider is the file size. So yeah, that's kind of my overview of what do you want to stand it for? I would say it's like your first lens, you know. Perfect. And and we'll move into probably the, the sweet spot of all portraiture is that what we call our, our portrait lens range, our short telephoto. A lot of times you'll see macros in this, this range. And these are portrait lenses because as Kirsty kind of started alluding to, you get that nice look of compression where the features flatten out a little bit. You can get a little further away from your subject. Uh, a lot of these lenses are also known. This is where you really start seeing a shallower depth of field even if you don't have a shallow aperture. So for, you know, you can get a longer, a, a longer lens that doesn't have as fast an aperture, but because of the, the physical mechanics of a longer lens, you're getting that compression, you're separating your, your subject from the background a little better, and you're getting that look of a shallower depth of field, um, which isn't necessarily a shallower depth of field. It's more the appearance of a shallower depth of field, but it's another conversation for an, another day. Um, is this the ideal pet photography range? I would say yes. I mean, I was talking about an 85 being in the standard, but 85 was also, you know, it's the top it's end of the standard and, and the, yeah. the entry of the short telephoto. Um, so yeah, I mean, 85 is where it's at for me. Um, I do see lots of photographers also with a 24 to 70, if you're more into Zooms, um, which I did have quite a lot of experience on many moons ago. Um, and is also a beautiful lens having your kit. So if you do have the budget and you're into zooms, then maybe that's your first lens to consider as well. The 24 to 70 just opens up all those options. Um, but yeah, moving more into the short telephoto from your 85 upwards, definitely. Um, just like with people, you know, that's, it's going to give you lots of options. You know, you can still with the 85 end um, and even, no, I'll stop myself. <laughs> with 85 end you can still do um your little close-ups like if you a lot of pet photographers like to do like close-ups of paws or the nose um or the eyes half of the face you can do that with your 85 um once you start going more more towards your 135 
well, you're probably gonna need something that grows there because you, well, anyway, just how it works. Um, so maybe a bit less, but then you've got the opposite end where your action stuff is really nice because you really can, as I was mentioning before, like kind of get that background to just kind of um, fade away a little bit through the, the illusion of the depth of field um, by having your dog running a bit closer to you than the background. Um, so if you've got, for example, I'm picturing a location I used to shoot at all the time nice quiet park, a nice row of trees in the background, and then uh, it, it finished behind me basically. So if I'm close to my ro the road behind me and I've got the dog running in front of me, closer to me than the trees, my 135 is like beautiful for that because the trees are going to completely drop out of focus. All the attention is going to be on this fast moving dog that you're going to capture with your um, beautiful autofocus. And uh, yeah, your 135 really allows that compression. So sort of somewhere in that range gives you lots of this, you know, versatility. And then, as I said, with the 85 before, you can still take your headshots um, and for your 135 as well, your full body, your cuddles with your people. We haven't even spoken about yet, but I mean, the for me personally, the big um, easily to sell images uh, we're always with the people, pets and their people, because people can't photograph themselves. Um, and so, well, not with their dog, not easily. And so to be able to capture a beautiful portrait of both the dog with their person um, is great as a professional photographer to be able to offer your clients and your sort of short tally photo, that 85 to 135 range. Beautiful for that because every woman looks beautiful with that lens. Like if you pose them nicely, and what woman doesn't want a beautiful photo of themselves with their dog? Like of our clients, all of them do. So yeah, having that lens for those—I um, mean, those images especially—is um, a really nice option. Now, before we move into the last group, which is going to be going to be interesting because this—that's where uh, you know that's where Kirsty's expertise takes over is in that medium to long tail photo, but. Is it true for a short telephoto or for your portrait lenses? Is it also a sweet spot? I would think because if you're too close to pets, they're distracted by you. But if you're too far, you lose kind of communication or, you know, the owner being able to wrangle them. Is there a sweet spot or am, or am I completely off base here? Because I don't I don't take pet photos as, as much um, to where you're a little backed off and it allows the pet to be more themselves and not be distracted by you. And you can kind of capture them in their element. Is there any truth to that? Uh, it's a good point that you raise. Um, I'm going to say actually the standard telephoto. So your range of 85 to 135 is actually, as I was mentioning before, really beautiful for your pets with people, because then you're not distracting the person if you're doing nice candid shots. So you can get a nice distance from the person where well, how I shoot at least is that I would set up the shot and then I ask like my client to just interact with their dog. And I'll say like, you know, give him a little scratch on the chest, scratch behind the ear, smush your face into his, like something like this, because I'm trying to get these natural connections happening. Then I'll move back and my 135 or the 85, like that range allows me to be back far enough that she doesn't feel like I'm watching her, but I'm still close enough that I can give instructions. So I can kind of yell a little bit, like pull him into you a bit closer, you know, scratch him under the ear, you know, just like working with um, people and their kids, for example. Um, I think it's like the same kind of vibe. What works for um, helping with pets, as you were suggesting before, Derek, two things. Number one, if your um, dog is nervous or anxious or not great with people, um, then having an even longer lens that we're going to move into the discussion about next is going to help you with that a lot. Um, so let's talk about that in a second. And for dogs that easily get distracted, you, I would actually suggest you want to be closer because then you can use the smell of the treats if they're treat driven, the noise of a squeaker toy if they're driven by toys um, or noise, um, a tennis ball if they're, if they're motivated by balls, um, or your own weird movement or sounds, being nice and close to them, you can move it all around and have them really follow you as you uh, take in the shot. So that's where, you're, for me, a 35 mil comes in handy really well because I can move nice and close to the dog. I don't have to perfectly center them because at 35, we don't have that distortion that we spoke about earlier, not as much as, say, 
16 mil. Um, and so I've got my freedom of framing how I want, but I can move nice and close to my dog so that I can be like putting the treat right up in their nose and then slowly moving it back while the owner has the lead because um, they, they're keeping the dog on the lead most of the time, which we remove in Photoshop. And then I can slowly move backwards with my camera, like and the treat on top, the camera, and then click and then move back in, smell the treat, get the attention again, move back out, click. So you're, the closer you are for dogs that are easily distracted, often the, the wider the lens you want, unless of course you're letting them run off a bit of steam, in which case you're gonna grab some action shots. And so that's when you want the opposite end. So it's a really good um, point that you brought up, Derek, actually like uh, which lens is better for dogs that are distracted because it's not always what we might seem. So that's where you can see the, the value of having these three different lengths really, you know, in the fact that they each play their part. And I would strongly suggest if you do work with rescue, which lots of pet photographers, when we're starting out, um, do try to work with rescues or shelters as volunteer photographers to learn animal behavior and, and shooting. I do recommend that. You probably do want a long lens, like I would say at least a 135 um, for that because you will come across dogs that are anxious, nervous, scared. And for that, you don't want to be getting up in their face whatsoever. Um, until you've like really built their trust. So that's when your sort of medium to long telephoto really comes to place. That was a nice little segue I gave you Look at you that there. segue there. <laughs> Keep going, go right, go right in. Tell us why, right. because for those of you who were not in the green room, all of you, Kirsten and I were talking, Kirsten's like, I don't want you to get ripped by the internet. She said, do not say that we don't use medium and long telephoto. Cause I'm over here thinking like 400, 600, like, yeah, it's great for birds that are like, three counties away, but I'm like pet photography. I'm like, cause for those again, on our intro end of the, the side, it's harder the longer you zoom in. So if you have a 400 millimeter, you look through, it's shaky. You have more elements, longer elements, heavier elements generally. And because you're covering such a distance, it's like looking through a telescope, your picture is going to move. It's harder to stabilize. Um, there's certain just physical characteristics that make it harder to use a super telephoto. But as I look through the images that Kirsty sent through, see a couple 70 to 200s, you remember that 7200 technically covers that medium or that long telephoto end. You know, you're getting into that, you're starting to creep towards it. So Kirsty, now as the expert, I'm going to I'm going to turn my mic off now. Tell us how I want to see what the range is. I want to know where the range, where do you kind of draw the line on the focal length and the medium and long end? And what do you use it for? All right. So a lot of this conversation has been centered around uh, photographing dogs. Okay. But as pet photographers, okay. Most of us, our main subject will be dogs, but a lot of us will also do some cats, some rodents, some snakes. I even photographed a crocodile once. Um, and then uh, horses as well. Now, Equine photography is really its own specialty. Um, so if you didn't grow up riding or you haven't spent much time around horses, I do recommend that you learn quite a bit before you start offering that um, because they're a big animal. Um, their owners um, really want somebody who's specialized in what you're doing. So I'm not here to try to give you equine advice, but I know a lot of um, pet photographers also do photograph some horses because most of us are animal people and uh, like me grew up with horses. So I'm gonna cover it a little bit, okay? Basically we have a bit of a rule, the bigger the animal, the longer the lens, which is the opposite to the bird photography you were saying, but for a different reason. So if you're photographing wildlife or birds, you want your 400, 600 mil, um, what do you call them, super telephoto, because the subject is so far away, right? You don't have to be like cropping in and then you can only print it this big. So that's the reason you want such a long lens for those. The reason for a horse that you want a long lens, and I'll elaborate further in a second, is because they're a big animal and they're often going to be far away from you. And it's that illusion of the depth of field that we spoke about earlier. Okay. So if you're going to go to show rings and photograph dressage or show jumping or horse shows, anything like that, I would suggest that you're um, shortest length is 200 mil, maybe an 85, but I doubt it. It's probably, in, it's the same idea of being like trying to photograph a bird. Okay. Like in the distance, because 
you know, show jumping or, or hacking or whatever, the, the animal is quite far from you often and you really want to have that compression and dropping that um, background out of focus because your uh, show ring side, you know, you've got like people in the background and all this kind of stuff. So you want to blur them out. Okay, so most like show horse photographers, um, which is a bit off from pets, but a lot of us do photograph that too. Um, they're, they're starting at 200 mil and I would say going up to 400 if they've got the budget. Okay, so your 70 to 200 is probably very good for that. Coming back um, even to like photographing black background horses at a stable, for example, even there your 85 mil is probably, you wouldn't want to go any wider than that, okay? Um, for the same reason, basically. Now, if we switch back to dogs, um, which is where I guess most of our conversation was was headed, most pet photographers' goal is to have, or it used to be anyway, was to have a 70 to 200. Um, quite an expensive zoom lens, um, if you're not familiar with them. Um, but it just gives you that range. So you've got the option of shooting at 70 or somewhere in between for those images we spoke about before. So I'm picturing like a location I used to shoot at. There was a, na a sorry narrow trail that led through the uh, bush. And so I would shoot a portrait of the dog like sitting in the middle of the trail at about 70 mil, okay? Uh, that was nice for that location, but then I could zoom in and I would get just the headshot without me moving, without the dog moving. Beautiful, okay? Then I would move back to the very start of the trail. I would take the sorry, the dog's person would take them to the, where there was a corner and I would say, okay, let them off. And because it's a trail, they were like, they kind of only had the option to come towards me. And so shooting that at, set, at 200, uh, a dog running towards you, uh, that action shot, you, you've got like beautiful options because you can track them along the way. So you can get the full body midair as they're really sprinting. And then the face expression as your second shot, as they're even closer again, and the background is completely out of focus. So the attention is really on this like amazing, like um, dog expression, like, you know, tongue everywhere, slobber flying, ears flying. And it's just like crisp sharp and you see nothing else except for the dog's head. And that's usually shot at your 200, maybe 135, but I would say 200. Yeah. So this is kind of the option you've got with your 7200. Um, it is the dream lens, like I said, for a lot of photographers. I used to shoot on it. Um, I mentioned earlier that I second shot weddings very early in my career. And the wedding photographer I, um, I was working for, I remember one day she started teasing me, like, do you ever take that thing off? Because it was my 70 to 200. <laughs> and it was like, I had it on as much as possible. And I was like, hmm, I don't know. I'm just used to it. I'm comfortable with it. I know it in my hands, as per the discussion earlier with you, Derek, um, as we all discussed earlier. And that actually really challenged me to start like switching it up. And I just found that, um, yeah, you know, you can, you really get a different look as you switch the lenses around. So I don't want to say like everybody, you have to go and get a 7200 because not long after that, I sold mine and I replaced it with an 85 mil. And then I shot with a 35 and an 85 prime, which are both pretty cheap lenses for oof, six years, maybe. And every now and again, doing an action shot or a dog that was very nervous, I would really miss that 70 to 200. Um, and I did reconsider or did consider repurchasing one for a while because I was doing a lot of work with um, dogs with behavioral issues. But in the end, I got by with the 85 and that was totally fine as well. So I don't want to say like limit yourself, guys, like, oh, go and get the most expensive, the 70 to 200. I mean, most of us are not looking at 400 mils, right? So, you know, the expensive one in our books is really the 70 to 200 and they're beautiful. It's a really beautiful lens. It gives you lots of vers you know, versatility, but you can also create some really beautiful stuff without it as well. Mm -hmm. Would you say, and just your quick in your opinion right here, because we didn't really talk about prime versus zooms. I'm guessing for people who are beginning, a zoom is going to be the way to go because you don't know you're going to, you're going to get one lens that covers a range as we've discussed, you're going to need probably a range of lenses um, if you're going to cover different types of looks and scenarios. But a zoom will allow you to see, okay, I can shoot a zoom for a year and then say, you know what, a lot of my stuff was out of 35. And then I noticed, you know, 35 and 70. And then if you want at that point, you can go buy a dedicated 35 and a dedicated, you know, maybe an 85 
Um, so would you say is that smart start start with like a 24 to 70 and if you could afford it even like an f4 version of like a 70 to 200 uh well, it's hard to know i would actually say go back to what you're enjoying shooting um mm -hmm. if you have got some gear to shoot on or you've been borrowing it or something um i once had a coaching student ask me the same question like oh what lens should i buy next and i said go through lightroom your lightroom kind of catalog and have a look at what you're mostly shooting on and uh, exactly like you said, that exercise was very interesting because I said, like initially she told me like, oh, I mostly shoot at 200. She went through her catalog and in fact, she mostly shot at 105 on her oh, 70 wow. to 200. So the next one she bought was at 135 actually, um, which was quite interesting. So people like to shoot differently and also you adapt to what you have. You know, like I was saying before, I used to just shoot on the 70 to 200 as much as possible. My 35 basically didn't come out of the bag. Then I bought the 85 and I realized like, oh, well, if I want to mix up my shots, I really need to use 35 as well because I didn't have the difference between the 70 and the, and the 200, right, By with the zoom. So you, I think you make do with what you actually have. Um, what would I start with? I'd start with an 85. I think it gives you the option of your um, doing your beautiful headshots without distortion, your full body portrait and close enough to doing some action. Um, so if you can just afford one of like something like that, that's what I would go for. Um, I would kind of counter your argument of like, but it's good to learn with the range. I think it's good to learn by challenging yourself to use your feet and learning that lens really well. Um, and then <laughs> did you lead me into that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, I love that you went there because I totally I feel the same way. But I feel like I don't know. I feel like it's easier to tell people to a zoom because it's i don't know but i i personally agree but i'm like i'm not like everybody but now there you just you well just no i'm me. i'm not like everybody okay i just want to add a little disclaimer most pet photographers i know really um uh really appreciate their zoom lenses um whether it's somebody that shoots wide or that shoots everything on like a long or medium telephoto um they really appreciate the the option of the quick you know, moving in and out. I'm a person that likes to move slowly during my shoot. Um, I like having, I only, well, I have two, two bodies that I take, but I shoot on just the one. And I like that I have to change the lens. It gives the client a break. It gives the dog a break. It gives me a little break just to change the lens. And it's a great excuse, you know, if like the client's getting frustrated, then I just say, actually, I'm going to change, change lenses. So just take it for a little walk over there. And then you know, the client remembers that they're actually here for a beautiful experience. They don't have to like get their dog to sit perfectly still, for example. So there's something to be said for the beauty of that, of forcing yourself to slow down. Primes are way cheaper as well most of the time. Um, or you can get like good quality glass for the same price and mm. say an F4 um, zoom. So that's also a big pro um, for me. Um, but again, if you like to move fast or you're doing lots of mini sessions, um, or you want your sessions done in 15 minutes and you want to be able to just zoom in, zoom out, like I was saying, I used to with the 70 to 200 in that trail, um, then maybe a zoom is for you. So I do encourage you to like start paying attention to how it is that you like to shoot. Um, maybe also if, you know, you've got some restrictions within yourself, um, maybe like getting down and up off the ground is a challenge for you at this point um, for some reason, because as dog photographers, we are always laying on the ground trying to get an eye level of the dog. So if I'm telling you like, oh, you've now got to get up and change your lens and that might not be practical for you right now, um, then a Zoom is going to be way better for you as well. So taking, I don't mean to like say, oh, there's no answer, <laughs> um, but I just really encourage you to think for yourself and like, what what is it that I like? What suits my shooting style? And that should give you the answer. Um, but if you're really lost, my vote is for an 85 mil, but I know if you're into Zooms, probably somebody would suggest a 24 to 70. I like I like that. I wasn't expecting you to say 85, and I love being surprised. So let's uh let's move into these images. Thank you for everybody who's been patiently waiting to see these images. We're gonna we're gonna get out, and uh, of course, we're Kirsty. Um, we're gonna drop your website in there for the Pet Photographers Club. And uh, if you have any information, any upcoming contests, please let the viewers know about that so that we can all join in. Um, we're going to show some images now. And uh, Kirsty, why don't you kind of lead us through here and talk a little bit. Look at that. We start with a wide angle. Yes, for sure. So I wanted to share some of these images with you. These ones are not mine. 
Um, so I mentioned earlier, I alluded to the um, International Pet Photographer of the Year Awards. It is hosted by us, the Pet Photographers Club. It's a free awards. Anybody in the world is welcome to enter. Um, and there's two levels you can enter as emerging or professional. So this is last year's winners because, as I said, this year is still underway. Um, so we've released our top 100 of each category. And if you are interested in seeing some amazing images, head on over to the website slash awards. Um, that is definitely going to show you like some amazing stuff because we've released the top 100 of each category. So there's you'll see them, but portrait, action, pets and their people and open. Um, that people can enter, photographers can enter into from all over the world. So the top 100 from this year of each category is released, but these ones are from last year because these are the winners of the categories. And actually this one is by Gina um, and she was our emerging international pet photographer of the year last year. So that means she entered probably four images. Um, so four different, one in each category. And she was the overall highest scoring combined uh, photographer in the emerging category. So. This is one of her images. Uh, big shout out to Gina, who is rocking it, by the way, now. Um, and it scored very well because um, we don't see cats very often. We definitely don't see cats with wide angles. Um, and that's exactly what this is. I mean, don't you love it? It looks like, I don't know, like a, a cat in the wild. I feel like that's been captured in one of those like um, hidden cameras. I don't know. That's mm. the vibe I get. It's like walking just, out of the frame. It's interesting. It's very cool. And we don't see this very often at all. So I added this one in here just to give you all as the the audience today um the opportunity to see that actually you can shoot wide if you want to for a very different look even though you won't see it much um throughout the niche it's not that popular or not that common I should say um but you can get stunning results as you can see here with Gina's image so you can really see see here that distortion that Derek was explaining earlier in the wider um end or the wider lenses. So this is a 24, 1.4 uh, um, aperture. And uh, you can see that like the head looks quite big in comparison to the body, right? And then the pore as well, because the pore, that front pore is closer to the lens. And so you've got that distortion of the pore and then the body that kind of shrinks backwards. And that's what that's the look that we get when you shoot on a 24 with the subject close to the lens, right, Derek? Mm -hmm. And then we're moving along into Veronica. So she was our uh, professional winner, overall winner last year. Um, and this was her Pets and Their People entry. And this is quite interesting because um, Veronica has actually used that um, perspective of the 24 really well here, I think, um, because it's kind of, you know, given that, that, that vibe of like really it pulls you into the image. So because the baby is completely centered, you don't notice that like the head is not distorted or anything, right? Because the baby's distorted. She's also a little bit further back than that cat image, um, even though it's also a 24 mil lens. Um, and here, what's quite interesting is that this is on a Canon 80D. And I mean, look at that image. It's like, this is one of my favorite images from all the awards of all time. I just think it's absolutely beautiful. It's so pulls you in. Um, but yeah, quite interesting to see that she shot this on an 80D. I never would have guessed. Um, and then interesting for you guys to check out the settings as well. So she shot it on 1.4. So that's what gives you that like very creamy, creamy look of the flowers around that are closer to the lens, closer to the lens. But also I know Veronica and that would be quite photoshopped around there as well. So <laughs> this is her work as well. So now we've moved into the 35. So you can see that you're getting a little bit closer to um, your natural eye perspective, right? I mean, she's kind of that distance away you can kind of get a vibe for where she's the photographer is standing in relation to where that image is although that's a trick because it must be on a tripod because that's uh, the photographer in the image <laughs> <laughs> but yeah anyway beautiful image as well by her also on a 35 and she's upgraded cameras by then I see uh Esther was our open winner last year so this was the category winner for open um again no mirrorless here either so shooting on the d750 um, a 35 mil, so coming closer to one of my favorite lenses here. That was actually a lens I had, 35 mil Sigma oh, 1.4. Love it. It's very beautiful. And again, you can see that even though it's that wider side, there's not really, I mean, it would be a bit hard to see in this image anyway, but there's not really the distortion because of where the distance she's shooting back and also the node is completely in the center, right? Mm. Mm, absolutely beautiful. Definitely. Love it. Love this. 
Yeah, Travis, he is super creative. If you want some inspiration for creativity when it comes to pet photography, definitely check out Travis's work. Um, if you put like five of his images together, at first glance, you wouldn't realize that they were all the same artist. But then once somebody tells you that they're the same artist, it's like, ah, oh, that makes sense. Like you're all creative and all of this. This was our action winner for last year. Again, a DSLR, he shot this one on. And here's the 2470 that we're speaking on. Um, I don't know what focal length is at there. I don't know if you want to take a guess, Derek. Um, I'm, I'm going to say 50 to 70. It was my guess as well. It looks like that. Um, like kind of not too wide, but nah, nah, maybe, yeah, maybe around 50. I'll say around 50. I should have asked him. Sorry, guys. I can't give you the information know, right I now. But, he um... has like a dead space <laughs> around it, so it kind of throws you off. So. But interesting thing here to note that we didn't speak of earlier. This was shot at ISO 800 um, on this Canon 5D. And I mean, it's, I can't really pick any noise. It's hard to see with this kind of, you know, on the monitor, et cetera. But um, that's something that you definitely want to consider when it comes to buying a camera for pet photography is how does it handle in low light? because um, a lot of the time, like shooting on 800 is a dream for me. I mean, I'm, 1600 is like pretty standard for me, ISO 1600, because I want a, sh a fast shutter speed because I'm shooting a moving animal. Um, and the other reason is because I'm shooting at either sunrise or more likely sunset. And so we have less light around. And so, you, you know, if, if it's, a, I know this is getting a bit technical, but if it's a bit darker, um, outside, but we need a fast shutter speed, then we need to get more light somehow. And if you're already on 2.8, <laughs> your only other option is uh, to bump up that ISO. So yeah, knowing that your camera can handle that um, low light with a high ISO is really, um, I would say quite important for photographers, especially natural light photographers. I actually, not studio photographers, not important for them, but uh, for natural light for sure. And anyway, Travis's image was on 800 and that's what made me think of that. But yeah, very creative, his work, huh? Definitely. Yeah. Different Kirstie. spin on the wide angle here. Well, yeah, this is your 24 to 70 she shot it on. Um, but yeah, definitely on the wider side. And doesn't it give a cool perspective with those mountains like drawing you into her? So that shot in New Zealand where Kirsty lives. Um, and she was a Pets and Their People winner for last year. So um, yeah, obviously this one grabbed the attention of the judges for sure because it's just a different perspective. If you do go and through, look through those top 100, you'll see that a lot of the images that are very popular within pet photography at the moment are very compressed. Um, the background is always, almost always um, out of focus. So when you're judging awards and you've got thousands of images coming in front of you, they all look like that. And then you have this one. Um, that shows a different perspective. It really grabs your attention and it draws you in to grab every little detail. And um, obviously that worked in Kessie's favor last year when uh, she took out the pets and their people winner. So I would just suggest like, don't be afraid to step a little bit back as well, even for your clients and take a shot like this, because a lot of my clients, like they would buy this for their wall because it's still got their dog. It's still got them, but it looks like a piece of art, like a landscape print. And so um, it's quite easy to sell because even if, um, somebody is worried about being a crazy dog person. Um, this doesn't really look like, you know, it's not like a big head of, uh, of their dog on their wall above the kitchen table with drool or something, you know, like this is a pleasant image. It's calming. So yeah, if you, if you like this kind of vibe, um, well, you can shoot it. If you've got a longer lens too, you just have to go way further back, <laughs> but 24 70 would go in your favor. I agree. And as you discussed, the trend is always shallow <laughs> this back to veronica's gorgeous work so yeah super sharp this image it, um yeah, it scored very highly and this is a prime um lens so that's actually quite interesting to see um so if veronica wanted the full body this is her own dog and if she wanted you know her dog with the full body shot she would have to walk backwards and maybe her dog i don't i actually think this is wrong because i know her dogs are very well trained but um if it wasn't as well trained that could have been a problem because as you move backwards if nobody's holding a lead your dog is going to run towards you so um yeah having an 85 uh worked well in veronica's favor favor wanting the headshot but maybe in the full body she might have wanted the zoom so something to consider for you guys 
Perfect. And I'm going to skip because I know where we want to get to some questions. So I'm going to skip just briefly through. I'll show you guys these, but I want to end on the last one because I think that's that was my favorite one just because you don't <laughs> see it so much. But these are just beautiful, beautiful images. But you can clearly see where probably what most people think of when they think of pet photography is this this general look right here. It's, it's beautiful. There, there you said with the with the horse. Yeah, so you my favorite image 70, of the group. 200 oh that, yes yeah. yes yes so 7200 on that yeah and beautiful beautiful and that's the same photographer that used the um the 24 on the cat so that's quite interesting oh interesting interesting yeah this image scored very highly how cool is that by jackie I love this. Mm -mm. so 85 mil like standard studio lens right um to have that kind of length in a studio is usually very popular um and she's just yeah, used it. Uh, Jackie has used it very well. Sorry, or well, seventy to two hundred, but at eighty mil, I should say. Sorry. Um, yeah, very nice and low ISO because then we can get all of the the detail and no noise, etc. And f seven point one. So, yeah, there's a nice range for you guys to see what can be achieved with a different um, kind of range of lenses and how uh, the same photographer can interpret you know images differently depending on their lenses. So hopefully that inspired. Uh, a bunch of you guys but definitely go and check out the website if you want to see some more amazing images or you can check us out on instagram we're always shouting out other photographers that's probably an easy way to scroll through and see just like huge range of pet photography yes definitely and we'll drop the the instagram in the chat for you guys and for those joining on vimeo on facebook we'll drop it in the comment section there it is the underscore pat pet pat the, the let's try this again the underscore pet underscore photographers underscore club right did i get it right yes for instagram that that's where you'll find us um or the website is really easy the pet photographers club.com can't really mess that one up Does not um, but yeah there is a free download if you do want like a quick overview of the gear list that we kind of ran through today with some pros and cons in there um if you just want that to reflect back on when you are choosing your lenses jump on the um website for that that one's really easy too so it's the same website the petsharpersclub.com slash gear dash list dash freebie but i think you guys have put, put a link to that somewhere um yep. so that everybody can have a look and and grab that as a little handy cheat sheet when they're trying to decide when you're trying to decide uh yeah what it is that you might like to buy next definitely we did drop that in the in the comment section for you guys and danny just dropped the the general website link as well so looks like we have one last question here that we're going to get to from uh, Zuzana. Zuzana's joining us on Vimeo. I'm using a mirrorless Olympus and want to switch to mirrorless Canon or Nikon. Could you break down which of the mirrorless cameras would be the best for dog photography? So Zuzana, no surprise here. I am going to tell you that they're all great. It's really which system is best for you. And I say system because I think we should be focused on systems and not cameras per se. You have to like the system. You have to like the ergonomics. You have to like the menu layouts. You have to like the color science. So there's certain things in certain brands that they might do better than other brands. And it really depends on, is that a, a key factor for me or is that not a key factor? So I would say really look at the overall lens offerings. Look at what third-party lenses might be available because you might have systems where there's not third-party lenses available that you like or prefer and then you're you can't save you know because a lot of people will save money by buying third-party lenses and some of these third-party lenses are very great lenses that that work very well with the most current technology in these these bodies so i know that was the greatest non-answer answer of all time but really canon nikon sony fujifilm olympus panasonic there's so many great cameras out there across these systems. It's really about which system you feel most comfortable with. Um, if you are in the tri-state area, I recommend all of you guys come out to B&H. We do have a full selection uh, of every camera brand you can imagine out there. So you can use the cameras, you can get them in your hands and see which, see which feels more comfortable. Or if you do have a, a local retailer by you and you're not local to us, definitely go out and feel it. You have to have it in your hands and feel if this is the system that feels right to you. Uh, they, they all offer great features. As, as we've said, you can go and you could buy a Canon Rebel XSI from the early 2000s, and you're still going to be able to great take, take great pictures with it. It's not going to have the feature set 
of a Sony Alpha 1, but you're still going to be able to great, take great images. I think that's what's important here. We tried to give you a baseline of information. We didn't give you everything. We couldn't go into everything. And uh, hopefully we didn't give you any wrong information. If we did, let me know. Don't send those messages to Kirsty. You send her the great messages. You send me the bad ones. Um, uh, but Kirsty, I, <laughs> I can take it. Eric, can I add really quickly to that totally. um, great advice you gave Zizana? Um, I would also recommend if um, if you can ask around. You can ask in the Peptographers group. We've got a free one or a members one. I think you're a member, Zizana. Um, and ask around if somebody has some bad files that you can take a look at. Um, this is something that I did. I reached out to a few different photographers that I know with different mirrorless systems. So I got like some files from Sony, Canon, Nikon. I compared them all um, because I'd heard like, oh, you're not going to like X um, company brand um, mirrorless because the files look dirty or the files are blah, 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 whatever. And so I reached out to somebody and I said like, oh, hey, I know you're shooting on this. Send me some RAWs that are shot in low light, underexposed, et cetera. Um, so I can see how they handle in my um, editing style. And actually it turned out that those files were very similar to my Nikon files. And so to me, they were normal and I knew how to work them really easily. If I hadn't have done that and I had to just listen to somebody telling me or a bunch of people actually telling me that they weren't happy with the files, I probably would have gone a different brand and I probably wouldn't have been, maybe I wouldn't have been happy with those files because they're so different to what I'm used to. So you know, there are so many elements that come to play. First of all, you want to know how it feels in your hands. Um, and then, yeah, how how those um, files are going to work for you. If you're, you know, used to working with certain files. If you're starting fresh, that's great too. You've got like all the options available, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, just considering the specs and what really what you really need. Like how big do you need your file sizes? Are you doing billboards? Or are you only going to a 20 by 30 inch canvas for your client? And a canvas can, hunt, you know, handle a little bit of grain or noise anyway. So then your files can be tiny or do you need huge files because X, Y, Z reason. So these are kind of some things that you can consider that we've touched on today. And then, you know, obviously the, all those other capabilities that Derek mentioned earlier and we've discussed along the way too, but I would really recommend that you, you know, reach out, ask in the group or, or wherever you can, does anybody have some crappy files that I can have a look at and, um, and then use that as a test. That's the best piece of advice I've ever heard for that question. And I, that's the first time I've ever heard that advice. So oh. we're going to leave it there. Usually everyone's like, no, no, no. Get the camera, borrow a camera, get your hands on the camera. That's always the advice I give. I'm going to have to use that for myself because that most people want to see the final result, right? Let me see the image file. Let me see the, let's show as the kids say these days, show me the receipts. I want to see the receipts on that. So Is that what they say? that's what they say. <laughs> they want to see the receipts. So Kirsty, I want to thank you. I don't even want to talk after that. You dropped a gem. Let's close on that gem. Send a huge thank you to Kirsty for joining us here. And for all of you sticking with us, I know we went a little bit over today, but we wanted to provide you guys with a full range of information. And really, even if we didn't answer all of your questions or go into all the details, hopefully we got the ball rolling and we at least gave you some sense of direction. So definitely check out the Pet Photographers Club and all the information that they have available, contests, information, and that whole community that Kirsty talked about. That's such an important thing um, with having Kirsty here, the experience. When you go into a community like that, you're getting experience from people who have been there, done that, who can save you some headaches, save you trying it and learning the hard way and save you some money by not going out and just buying gear just to try it out and see what works. So huge thank you again, Kirsty. It was great having you on. I, I hope to have you back in the the future and then we can get into something more, let's say less gear related, more about the real heart of you doing what you do. So any last words? No, I think you, oh, I guess you've summed it up really well, um, Derek. So thanks so much for having me on board. I would love to see um, heaps of you guys joining in on our conversations in the Facebook groups. It's a great place to start. Um, I did mention that there is a free one that anybody's welcome to join. Um, and there's always, you know, questions in there and people answering. So join us there. Um, if you do want to become a member, it's uh, $10 a month and uh, you get like heaps of free content, heaps of bonuses, discounts for any workshops we host, et cetera. So check out the membership. But um, primarily what we teach is about the business of pet photography. So if you are looking at going pro or you're pro, but not really hitting your goals yet, or you're just started hitting your goals and you want to push them and make new ones. Um, that's what we're all about at the pet photographers club. We are about making money from this awesome job that we have because isn't being a pet photographer, the best job in the world. 
Um, so I would love to see you guys in the club in some uh, shape, form, whatever, um, or join the conversation on Instagram. We're active on there as well. So that's it from me. Thanks for hanging out for this hour and almost a half. Sorry to keep you guys a bit longer. We went over time. I got excited when we started talking about lenses. So thanks for staying with me. And Derek, you've been an awesome host. So uh, yeah, thank you to you and b and Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kirsty. Huge thank you, of course, to all of our viewers. Can't do it without you. We do it for you. So we got another rendition of the BNH virtual event spaces in the books. Catch y'all next time.